Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's program, the Electric Vehicle Buyer's Guide with Scott Allen from the C Citizens Utility Board. This program is being hosted by the Winneka Northfield Public Library, and we are in partnership with the Wilmette and Glenview Public Libraries. Uh, the Citizens Utility Board, also known as CUB, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan consumer advocacy and utility watchdog organization that was established in 1983 and represents utility consumers in front of the courts and other public bodies. The organization also provides consumer education like tonight and to protect the health and welfare of the public. Our speaker, Scott Allen, is CUB's Renewable Energy Policy Coordinator. He joined the organization in 2014, and in 2018, he worked with uh, the Illinois Clean, uh, Clean Jobs Coalition and helped pass the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. Currently, he lives in Bloomington, but travels the state to work on issues related to municipal and co-op utilities. So please welcome our speaker, Scott Allen. Thank you, Jill. And yes, welcome everybody. I'm glad to see so many people here, especially well met, turn it out. Um, so before I start my presentation, I do want to link uh, in case anybody hasn't or doesn't have access yet to Cubs EV Buyer's Guide. I will put that in the chat and you can kind of scroll through it if you'd like uh, while we go through this presentation. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Jill, for uh, for hosting this and to uh, all the libraries. Uh, libraries are kind of core to Cubs uh, founding and mission. So I love working with libraries and I will start sharing my screen. Okay, let's see if this works. All right, I suspect everybody can see that now. So yeah, um, Jill, thank you for that introduction and the introduction to CUB. So uh, we, a, a lot of what we do are presentations like this. We do about 500 events a year, either in person or virtually. And over the last few years, we have been getting a lot more questions from people about electric vehicles. Um, some people wanna know just about buying the vehicle itself how to choose the right, the one that's right for them. And um, other people are kind of curious or concerned about uh, kind of switching from the gas pump to the electric bill to fuel these vehicles. And it's not always clear, like which one is, is cheaper? What are the environmental impacts of that? And you know, we do talk to a lot of environment, environmentally minded people and they want to know if EVs are really cleaner than combustion engines. Um, mining for batteries is certainly a dirty business. Um, but what about the idea that we're fueling our cars uh, with coal plants? I hear that a lot as well. So that's why Cub put this guide together. Uh, we want to share this comprehensive information with people again, on the buying the vehicle side, but also what we as consumers need to think about as well and how EVs can benefit um, the electric grid, uh, us as consumers and environmental impacts as well. And so we kind of get into this concept of beneficial electrification when we talk about it. Like what are the, how can we, when we bring EVs online, how can we make, make that benefit everybody? Um, I like to ask people to imagine if you woke up tomorrow and your everybody's car was replaced with an EV, we could figure out how to drive it quickly enough and we all understand how to plug in an appliance, but what would happen to the grid if suddenly 80% of the people in Illinois plugged in their electric vehicles kind of all at once? Um, but if we plan these things and we manage and kind of adjust our habits, uh, electric vehicles do offer uh, huge potential benefits to us as consumers, but also to kind of us as a society and to our grid. And so luckily, we're not the only people thinking about this at CUB. Um, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act had that in mind when we were putting that together, just generally the General Assembly said um, through the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, one of the goals we want to accomplish is replacing 
roughly the equivalent of 1 million gas and diesel engines with electric vehicles on Illinois roads by 2030. Um, and so we have to get our utilities also thinking in that direction. They need to plan their grids better so that we can have this mass adoption of electric vehicles. Um, and we'll look at some of the programs that utilities offer, ComEd offers to help us offset costs. And then I do wanna set aside just a couple of minutes, hopefully at the end to talk about for anybody in Winnetka, uh, there are a few other considerations on the consumer side, on the electricity side that you need to think about. And we'll kind of get into that, but, um, and I'll, I'll point out too that this guide was published between 2021 and 2022. So the core principles still apply, but there are some examples in the guide where we use ComEd energy prices. And since 2022, ComEd energy prices have fallen um, a little by a little over a half, I think. Uh, and so I'll point out where some future or some updates have, have occurred and that applies also to the rebate section. But we'll start out with what is an, what is an electric vehicle. And not all electric vehicles are equal. That is in terms of the performance, but also in terms of, <clears throat> of rebates as well. So first we have the battery electric vehicle. Okay, and Scott, I'm sorry. Your screen is still loading. We have a black screen. Oh, no. screen. Yeah. Uh, let me let me try that again. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, I apologize, but I don't know what. It, let me. Um, let's see. How about now? Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. Okay, I apologize for that. You didn't, you didn't miss much. Um, I, I just had a slide that uh, asked, "What is an EV?" And not all EVs are created equal. And this is the link to the buyer guide. Um, so yeah, the battery electric vehicle. Uh, this is a, a car that runs on all electricity. You can see it has a big battery pack here, but it doesn't have um, a drivetrain. It doesn't have an engine up front. So that's one type of EV. Uh, the second type is a plug-in hybrid electric. You can see that it has a smaller battery pack here. It also has a charge port, but it has a fuel tank. Um, and then we come up here and we see an electric motor. So a car like this, a plug-in hybrid, will run on this battery until the battery is depleted and then it switches over to a gas engine. Um, the third type, which is, the, it's a little misleading. We don't really, I say we kind of in, in you know, the, I guess the industry don't consider hybrids electric vehicles because they do run on gas. You see that you have your fuel tank here and you have, this little traction battery pack. So what this is doing is you have um, an electric motor that works in conjunction with the internal combustion engine to help the gas engine uh, work a little more efficiently. You don't plug these in. These batteries are refilled by the kind of this regenerative braking. So anytime you use the brakes, it uses that resistance to send a charge to the battery pack and then it works in conjunction with the engine. Um, this is, a, so you think of uh, the the uh, Prius, the Toyota Prius, for example, when those came out, they're, they're hybrids, you can't charge them up. And that's important because uh, when we talk about the rebates, uh, hybrid vehicles are not eligible for either state or federal rebates. They do get much better gas mileage, but again, we don't consider them an electric vehicle for the purposes of tailpipe emissions or rebates. Uh, why are we seeing this explosive growth in electric vehicles? Uh, a couple of reasons here in Illinois. One, uh, transportation or tailpipe emissions have overtaken the electricity generation sector for uh, greenhouse gas pollution. 
Um, and as I said, Illinois legislation in CJA, we had a goal to incentivize the adoption of electric vehicles. And so um, I think that brought the conversation to the fore. Um, in the first part of the guide, you'll see we discuss consumer benefits first. I, we are a consumer advocacy organization, so that's kind of the most important thing for us at CUB and try to deal with some of those questions that people have. What is it? How do I benefit from this? Is it cheaper to switch the get, you know, switch the gas pump and go to the electric bill for our fueling costs? And the answer to that, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, the price of gasoline fluctuates. It tends to go, you know, between two fifty and three dollars a gallon, at least in my part of the state. Electricity prices fluctuate also. Like I said, this time last year, ComEd users or ComEd customers, their electric costs were about double what they are now. Um, but even within that range, even with those much higher ComEd prices, we do find that it's still cheaper to um, to charge a vehicle rather than fuel it. Uh, there are also another kind of big consumer benefit are lower maintenance costs. Like we saw with the battery electric vehicle, there are far fewer moving parts. You don't have a drivetrain, you don't have uh, water pumps, you don't have pistons, you don't have transmission. So fewer points of failure, but we do have to kind of talk about the battery. Now we have one kind of large expensive point of failure, which is the battery pack. And um, most of the electric vehicle warranties or the battery warranties that we see tend to be about eight years, 100,000 miles. So there is kind of a guarantee on the performance of that battery pack. So if it has to be replaced, hopefully it's covered under that warranty. Um, and a consumer, a, a person can expect to lose around one to 2% of range year over year as they use the car. Um, you figure a car, the average person keeps a car for about 12 years. So, you know, we also have those considerations for our internal combustion engines too. What can go wrong in that that 12 year span? Uh, but there, there are reuses for batteries and we are able to recycle those. I'll get into some of that reuse um, a little bit later on. Um, Kind of the third biggest concern that people have is what is the cost and especially when I'm going to be charging this thing, what kind of costs am I going to be looking at? Uh, some things to offset that cost. First, it, it I, you know, can't hide the fact that yes, electric vehicles do tend to be more expensive by a few thousand dollars than a comparable uh, gas model. So if you're buying an electric Camry versus a gas powered Camry, the electric Camry is gonna be more expensive. But keep in mind again, that one, we have rebates. So that helps offset that cost. We have those lower maintenance costs. Uh, electricity is cheaper than gas. And it, right now, if you're a ComEd customer and you're just on the straight flat rate ComEd plan, you're paying um, about seven cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. So if you go to that guide and you see we're using 2022 numbers, you can plug in uh, seven cents per kilowatt hour into that calculation and get an idea of um, how much cheaper it is. A lot of people also choose to pair solar with electric vehicles. And if a person is considering getting solar, an installer will usually ask, do you plan on electrifying your home? Meaning getting rid of your gas furnace, installing an electric furnace. Um, do you plan on getting an electric vehicle? And if you're installing solar, they will kind of overbuild to account for the fact that your electric load is gonna increase. Uh, again, there's a different consideration for people in Winnetka that we'll get to at the end. Um, for ComEd customers, we advise people under any circumstances, but especially if they have EVs, to check out ComEd's hourly pricing program. It allows you to pay the actual cost of electricity. And I have a screenshot. I'll explain more about how that works. Um, people in Winnetka, you don't have access to these kinds of variable rate plans. So it doesn't matter when you charge your electric vehicle, you're paying the same rate um, 24 hours a day. 
range. Um, uh, another big concern that people have, uh, it, it may in fact be the biggest out of all these we've uh, we've addressed, or at least the one that first comes to mind for people is, am I going to be able to drive this thing and get a charge, or am I going to be stranded in the middle of nowhere? Um, these are only really a concern for the all battery electric vehicle. So with the plug-in hybrid and the hybrid, those things run on gas. So it doesn't matter when your battery runs out because you can switch to gasoline. So uh, one of the considerations that people need to make is, A, do different models offer uh, a larger battery? And so that lo a larger battery equals longer range, but it's also going to cost you a little bit more. We want people to think about what kind of driving they do too. Do you drive mostly local? Do you travel a lot? Um, I saw somebody put in, into the chat that uh, uh, talking about the extreme weather and it's not just the extreme cold. Batteries do have some performance issues in the extreme heat as well. And if you use uh, the air conditioning or the heater, that is also drawn, drawing power from the battery. So that's going to decrease range. Um, but we also have to think about the fact that most people have their car parked vast majority of the time their car is parked and most people drive fewer than 20 miles a day. So when people are, are you know, kind of doing the math on whether or not they actually want to buy an electric vehicle, in terms of range, thinking, think about how, you know, what your driving habits are, and that will really help you, um, you know, maybe right now it makes sense to have a plug-in hybrid, or maybe it's possible if you take one or two really long trips that, okay, we could do an electric vehicle, but maybe we rent a car for the summer or something. The rebates and fees, um, uh, there's kind of no way around this. This stuff is really confusing and it's uh, it's still evolving, both at the federal and the state level. So the federal incentives have kind of been um, picked up the Inflation Reduction Act, change a couple of things about that. Uh, federal government used to offer a $7,500 tax credit um, it's no longer a tax credit. Instead, now, uh, the, the idea, the hope is that that credit will be offered um, in, in like upfront. So you'll get $7,500 off the price of the vehicle. The dealer will then kind of claim that tax credit and they will carry it until they can write it off on their taxes. Uh, but there are some qualifications. Uh, 300,000 for married couples and on down, you can, oh, you can see here. Um, so the income range is pretty high, I would say for most people, but for people who do make more than this per year, they're not going to qualify for the rebate. The good news is though, now that it's no longer being offered as a tax credit, your tax liability doesn't matter. So you don't need to worry about whether or not this credit is gonna be able to offset your tax obligation as long as you meet these criteria up here. Um, as I said uh, at the beginning, these tax credits are only for the all electric vehicles and the plug-in hybrids. Um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we see source requirements, so they have to be assembled in North America. The batteries will have to be sourced um, or manufactured in uh, North America as well. The price of the car is going to matter, so it has to be less than $55,000 for a car and less than $80,000 for an SUV or truck. Um, there are a wide range of electric vehicles from domestic manufacturers that fall well within this window. Um, I live in Bloomington, the home of Rivian. I see tons of Rivians on the road here. Uh, Rivian does have models that go above $80,000, but they also have models that are under $80,000 for both their truck and their SUV, but it's something to keep in mind. And I'll put this link uh, in the chat after we're done here, and then Jill's going to send it out also. But there are a lot of details in this federal rebate, and there's an article published by NPR that really does a good job of making sense of 
all of these rebates and uh, some more things to consider. So we'll make that link available. Um, on the Illinois side, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this because the program is out of money. Um, it uh, This rebate idea came together shortly after CJA passed. The governor was really hot on offering a rebate to Illinois people, $4,000 rebate. Um, I'll make this article available in the chat as well. Uh, so there are also a lot of exceptions to this, um, which the article lists, but the bottom line is that for January, for 2023, they were taking applications starting November 1st, meaning that if you bought an electric vehicle in January, February, whatever, of 2023, save that paperwork, get it into the state by November 1st, and you would have until January 31st of this year. So in a few days, that program was set to change. Well, the program ran out of money in a matter of days. They had quite a few people applying for this rebate and they spent that, it wasn't a lot of money to begin with. It was only enough for maybe 5,000 rebates. And the state also prioritized um, uh, low income people. They got moved to the front of the line, which is a good thing because this transition to electric vehicles is much, much harder on low income people. Um, there will be future offerings. This is a priority program not just for the state of Illinois and not just for the EPA, but for lawmakers also, though they're well aware of kind of the kinks that are in this program and, and the funding source. So I expect in future years, program years, we're going to see a larger fund and uh, make it a lot easier for people to get that paperwork in. Uh, we will be keeping up with this at CUB, so I'll flash my information at the end. Uh, if you want to send an email at some point and say, hey, what have you guys heard about the Illinois uh, program? Be happy to, to keep you filled in on that. Um, there is one fee associated with owning an electric vehicle in, in Illinois. There was a big debate about this uh, two, three years ago. Uh, these EV users, they won't be paying gas tax and so they won't be paying road, road taxes. So uh, the compromise at the state, I think at one point they wanted to charge something like $500 a year for an EV user. Uh, now it's $100. So when you register your car for the first time, um, it'll cost you an extra 100 bucks. Uh, I expect that this is going to change at some point in the future, too. There will be a fair, fairer way to assess uh, assess this fee, um, You know, the contribution to the road funds for EV users. Getting into charging, uh, definitely something that people think a lot about. Whole lot of considerations here um, that are laid out in the guide, but the key takeaways I think are um, charging at home versus public. Most people choose to charge at home and that is probably the cheapest way to go. I say probably because different public charging owners have different ways of uh, billing people, charging people to use their equipment. It's hard to say charging your car and charging you to charge your car. But um, so for home charging, there are two different, there are three levels of, of EV charging chargers, uh, but only two of them apply to home use. The first is 120 volt. Uh, that is, you know, any three prong, three prong plug in that you have in your house, 120 volt. If you have one of those in your garage, good to go. You probably don't need to upgrade your electric service, but keep in mind that one hour of charging this way will get you three to five miles of range. So it will take quite a long time to put the battery at full charge. Now a level two charger, that is the 240 volt. So like a larger appliance or refrigerator, 240 volt, and then 32 to 40 amp service. So if you don't have, for example, in your garage, if you don't have uh, 240 volt service in your garage, um, you would want to, I mean, you could do it yourself. <laughs> that might be interesting, but probably best to call an electrician and have them come out and install that. Um, and you, so the level one charger does come with the car. 
The level two charger, often you have to you have to purchase that. There are many different places you can purchase EV chargers, and they run from two hundred to a thousand dollars. I say that it might be hard in Winnetka only because, um, again, with uh, ComEd, we know that their grid is capable of this, and if it's not, they will deal with that. I, I know a person in Naperville, also a municipal utility. He wanted to install a level two charger in his garage. They came out and did a uh, like an engineering study and said, you know, our, our you know our transformer or whatever our substation we can't quite handle it. So we can upgrade that so that you're able to add this, but we're going to have to charge you about seven thousand dollars for that. So don't know that that's the case in Winnetka. I'm just saying that um, you would definitely want to check with the city before you, uh, you'd have to do that anyway, but um, check with the city on that. Charging is made a lot easier in the home with the use of an app. So especially ComEd, we have smart meters, we have a smarter grid. If you're on ComEd's hourly pricing program, you would definitely want to use this app. So let's say that pull your car to the garage, plug it in, but it's not actually drawing power yet. You want to be able to program when you start charging. Uh, maybe you're laying in bed and you see that, oh, prices are, you know, half a cent per kilowatt hour. I'm going to start this thing charging for, for you now. Um, so using these smart charging methods and kind of changing our behavior to take advantage of the smart grid is cheaper for us, but it is also better and less stressful for the grid. Uh, public charging, again, still a good idea to read through the guide. Uh, there are um, a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different ways that you will have to pay for this charging. Uh, in some cases, it's free. All public charging, at least that I'm aware of, is at least level two and for the most part, level three. So those level three chargers, that is a huge service that you I mean, you maybe could put it in your home, but I don't know how um, you know, the code inspectors would feel about that. Uh, that is going to get you 15 minutes, will get you about 200 miles. The price varies. Some places, again, it's free. You can go to maybe the shopping mall. They have a level three charger there. You plug it in and they do it for free. Some charge you by the kilowatt hour. Um, there are other places in other states that have different schemes for uh, charging people to charge their cars. Um, Tesla has a lot of fast chargers built around the country, but they only work with Teslas. Uh, there might be some adapter that you can purchase in the future. I don't know if Tesla is going to be in for that or not. Um, but right now, only if you own a Tesla can you use their fast chargers. Uh, the good news is that especially here in Illinois and especially in the more rural parts of the state, we are going to see um, our level three charging networks kind of explode in the next couple of years. And I suspect that um, we will see that in the region too. Uh, governor Pritzker has joined with other, other governors in the Midwest to talk about, you know, having a fair exchange. If I go to Iowa, for example, um, and I'm from Illinois, they're not going to say, well, for out-of-state people, we're going to charge them double what we would for an Iowa person. So we want to make these chargers, these charging networks nationwide kind of, um, you know, work together, have agreements that we can all kind of set a price for charging. There are also a lot of apps that you can download uh, on your phone to show you where level three charging is and generally what they Again, what they charge you to charge there. Uh, another quick note on batteries, especially when we're um, we're talking about charging. You know, so we talked about uh, how range is reduced in extreme weather and over time. But um, I I want to make a special note on what you should think about when you're charging your batteries. First off. Follow the re the manufacturer's recommendations. I you know they're not going to mislead you on that. We do know that level three charges are extra stressful on batteries. That's shooting a whole bunch of energy into your battery in a very short amount of time. 
and these things, the way that they work, I think is that they can, they can up to 80% charge that can happen very quickly when it hits 80%, the charging rate slows down a little bit so that it, um, I, I suspect some of it doesn't cause bad things to happen with the battery and, you know, Will the manufacturer, do they have special recommendations on, it's always a good idea to have your car at a full charge, or uh, you should um, try to keep it in this range, you know, the 60 to 70% range on a charge. Um, some batteries do, some manufacturers do allow when you're charging at home a bi-directional flow, which means that you can kind of use take the battery from your car and run it back into your service uh this isn't going to run your entire house maybe it can it could run a small appliance for a short amount of time um again the manufacturer will talk about all of this all of this stuff and uh just kind of quickly referring back to i said future uses for batteries we are going to have Part of the reason that we're building a smart grid and that ComEd is kind of planning and building the smart grid is that we do hope in the future to be able to have a really smooth experience with if you want to use your electric vehicle, um, you know, let's say that you have solar panels, but you don't have a battery bank. Well, your car is sort of a battery bank. And we want to make sure that people have a smooth transition that you can discharge that battery and um, help offset the electricity that you're using. And I think even more importantly, um, you know, think about uh, in the summertime, you have these huge fleets of school buses that are just sitting idle. But if we had a whole fleet of electric school buses, that's sort of like having this gigantic battery bank that if we're over-generating solar or over-generating wind, um, we can have these buses take that charge in, and then at night when the sun isn't shining, we can dispatch that electricity back out to the grid. So these are some of the things that we think about when we when we talk about how do we you know plan our grid so that electric vehicles offer more benefits than just uh, pollution reduction. Um, so I kind of already uh, talked about that. But uh, the information on this slide, um, in the future, for future usage, we are going to think more about managed charging and dispatch. Um, and it's it's a good idea now to obviously charge during off-peak times, not just because it's cheaper for us, but it's also better and easier on the grid. Uh, as our homes, as our appliances get better, you know, it's not inconceivable to think that you know, you're, and for some people aren't into this whole thing, but your refrigerator could talk to your electric vehicle and say that, hey, you're not using uh, any of that battery right now. How about we suck some of the electricity out of the battery and offset the usage of the refrigerator when it kicks on? Um, so in the future, we'll see utilities and uh, be able to take full advantage of their smart meters and help us figure out more beneficial uses for our electric vehicles. Now, this does depend on the utility. And um, so ComEd, for example, like we can tell by law, we can tell, we told ComEd in CJA that this is what we want you to plan for. We want you to plan for a million electric vehicles plugging into your grid. Um, and we want you to think about where on your grid you need to make upgrades to prepare for this. And we want you to think about using school buses as you know dispatchable resources. And ComEd, they don't necessarily like that, but it's in the law, so they have to do it. And the rate of profit ComEd returns partially depends on how well they plan their grid. If they don't plan it very well, then they're not going to get the rate of profit that they want. Well, for uh, Winnetka and other municipal utilities, we can't, we don't tell them in the same way that you have to plan your grid this way. And so that goes the same with rates. Um, 
Winnetka and other municipal utilities, they don't offer those variable rate programs like ComEd does. I mentioned uh, going solar in Winnetka to kind of offset some of your EV use. You can certainly do that in the city of Winnetka. Winnetka does though, prob they have restrictions on how much solar you can build. I believe it's a 10 kilowatt limit. And so as an Ameren customer, I don't have a limit. If I have an EV and I want to electrify my home, Ameren will let me build to accommodate that. But in Winnetka, I believe you're cut off at 10, 10 kilowatts. Um, I, you know, I'm not making any comments on the state of Winnetka's grid. I don't know. I don't know how much planning the city council does to, um, to one day say that we need bi-directional smart meters and we need to make sure that all of these different nodes can take in and give out all this electricity. Um, and these issues of rate plans and solar policies, they are not insignificant for our pocketbooks or for the resiliency of our grid or for the environment. Um, our state has said that this is a priority for us and we can direct ComEd and Ameren to do these things, but we cannot direct municipal utilities to do those things. So it's kind of on you, the people working with your village boards and your city councils to say, you know, how prepared are we for mass EV adoption in Winnetka? And um, could we consider variable rate plans in the future? And so with that, I just kind of want to give an example of what I mean. So um, on this side, we see here are Winnetka's electric rates, uh, 2023 versus this year. So um, uh, for per kilowatt hour, and I don't exactly know how Winnetka breaks down their utility bills, but this year in the winter, you'll be paying about 16 cents per kilowatt hour in the summer, about 17 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it appears that the fixed charge in Winnetka for a phase one customer, which I suspect most of you are, is $20.87. Now, if you're a ComEd customer, and you want to opt into their hourly pricing program, recall I said that that allows you to pay the actual price of electricity. So um, this is just a screen grab from January 12th. Of, this is what electricity prices were doing all that day. And so they topped out at, it looks like around two cents per kilowatt hour. If you're not on, if you're a ComEd customer, but you're not on this plan, Remember that you're paying, what was it, um, six and a half, seven cents per kilowatt hour. If you're an hourly customer, hourly pricing customer, the most you were paying on January 12th of 2024 was about two cents per kilowatt hour. This is unusual. It doesn't happen, especially during the day. Um, it happens more often at night, but the, the actual price of electricity goes negative. Um, on this particular day at 10 a.m., the price of electricity was negative 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour. And what that means is that um, we were making more electricity than anybody was calling for at that time. So ComEd is crediting people for being off takers of that electricity. This would have been a great time to pay attention to plug in your electric vehicle and charge it between the hours of 9, 10, 11 and noon. And then again at um, a little after two and around four o'clock uh, because it, you would have gotten credits on your bill for that. Um, again, solar, uh, it's a win for customers. It's a win for the grid. Uh, Investor-owned utilities, like I said, they allow you to overbuild your solar to compensate for an electric EV. And ComEd is required by law to credit you for what you overproduce. Um, it's, it's great for EV users and it's great as we electrify our homes. Uh, for people in Winnetka, this is telling us again that they are limiting you to a 10 kilowatt system or less and that you have to indemnify on your homeowner's insurance, the village um, and its officers. Uh, also keep in mind for the environmentally minded people out there that 78% of Winnetka's electricity does come from coal. It comes from the Prairie State coal plant down here in Southern Illinois. 
um, and from Trimble County in Kentucky. I compare that to ComEd, ComEd customers, about 22% of your electricity comes from coal. Now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pick on Winnetka here. Uh, Winnetka does an excellent job, um, but these things do matter for rate payers. And either way about it, even with that 78% coming from coal, EVs are better for the environment. So I don't mean to discourage anybody. I just want you all to have um, the, you know, the full information on that. Um, again, grid preparation, we don't have to go through all of that again, except to say that smart grids, energy efficiency, pricing programs, demand response programs are good for us, for our, the grid, for the environment. Um, I will leave this up on the screen for just a few minutes in case anybody wants to send me an email or give me a call at any point. Um, and then uh, once I bring this down, I will put the links uh, to the two articles and ComEd's hourly pricing program in the chat. But Jill, I think we can open it up to questions if if everybody's ready, if we have any. Hi, yeah, we do have questions in the chat and the Q&A. Do you want me to read them off to you or? I think, um, I'll start with the q and I can I can see it here. Um, okay. Earl says waiting for prices to come down, batteries to get better. Uh, is there any chance for one, two, or all three of these things happening in 2024? That's a that's a great question, Earl, and it's a question I ask myself quite a bit. Um, I think yes, that we can expect to see that at least start in 2024 on prices coming down and more charging stations across the country. Uh, batteries getting better. I'm a little less. I, I I don't keep up as well on the car, you know, the car battery technology. Um, but if not this year, in the near future, uh, I I do expect uh, to see some pretty big changes there and. In full disclosure, I am also waiting on all of those things personally. Um, commenting on the license plate fee for BEVs, uh, yes, Raymond, I, I I I hope that I covered that. The the idea of charging that fee, um, kind of in lieu of the road taxes, uh, break even or distance usage of EVs versus internal combustion engines from a carbon carbon equivalent standpoint. Um, I, we do hint at some of that in the guide, I believe, and I have read, uh, depending on the source, I've kind of read some, um, they're not vastly different from one another, but it. I, I think that some people, when they factor in, they do like the cradle to grave factor, like you know the, the mining and the emissions to charge and all of that stuff. Um, so it does vary quite a bit. Uh, Bill, I would be happy if you want to send me an email to, uh, see if I can dig up some of those articles that I've read on that, some of the research I've read on that and, and share it. Um, yeah, the pre-owned, uh, Sarah, to your question, Sarah asked, surprised that a pre-owned Bolt is about the same price as brand new don't want to purchase a new EV, do a, a new car's environmental impact. Um, I agree. I think that, and this is something that we've talked a lot about as well. Uh, I think, so in the pre-owned cars, we definitely saw over COVID that the pre-owned car market for any type of car went really insane because, um, you know, manufacturing dropped. Those constraints were kind of doubled for EVs because not only were they producing fewer of them during the pandemic and there were the same supply line constraints, it's just that overall there is a much smaller used EV market because there are much fewer of them on the road. And these rebates do apply to used EVs, but we're still seeing that kind of uh, craziness that yes, it costs just as much to buy it used because there's not a big, robust used EV market just yet. Um, personally, that's the way I'm going to go to because 
I would rather reuse recycle than, you know, buying something new and being resp responsible for all of those emissions. But uh, that is what I understand is that it's kind of the, the COVID restraints that we see on everything, plus the fact that we don't have a robust used EV market just yet. Um, and now switching to the chat. Um, the is the one to two percent range loss per year or by the end of life eight years uh so i think the way that that's calculated is that for every year you own that car you can expect it to lose about one to two percent of range per year so um uh i don't know that i was saying that on average i think people tend to keep a car about 12 years and so that's 12 years of one, you know, so it'd be one to 24% loss in um, battery over that time. And uh, Regina, your questions about charging, I hope that I answered those, uh, except for the how much does it cost to replace a battery if not covered by warranty? Um, I don't know. I've heard varying sources from people who own different types that it, you know, so, some people have told me with, I think, a Tesla that a replacement battery was something like $15,000, which uh, almost made me have a heart attack. Um, you know, but then I think, too, about uh, if the transmission goes out in my car. That's $5,000 right off the jump. And, you know, it's going to cost me, I don't know, 500 bucks to get a new water pump put on it. So... Uh, does this include BTG or BTL capabilities? I'm not, I'm sorry, uh, Niraj, I'm not familiar with those, um, act, those abbreviations. Uh, the environmental impact and pollution of the manufacturer, I think that's similar to the question, maybe similar to the question that Bill asked. And again, it's, I've seen, I've seen varying uh, measures of that impact. It depends on, are you considering all of the environmental impact on mining and manufacturing and shipping the battery and all, on all of that? So I would like to see a more standardized, and I, I can take a look and see if I can find a more standardized comparison. For uh, a hybrid, a Prius, um, I actually am not aware of that traction battery. What I suspect that those things probably last longer than the battery of an all electric vehicle because, you know, one, they're much smaller, and two, you don't have the stress of, you know, running electricity into them. They they stay charged by regenerative braking. So I would suspect that a, a Prius battery pack would last quite a long time. Auto insurance premiums, I don't, that is one area in the cub guide that I don't believe we cover, at least not in a lot of detail. I think maybe there's a word in there about, you know, you need to check with your insurance uh, cover. And to be honest, that is a blind spot for me um, and something that I think we need to consider in updating our uh, guide and our presentations. Comment offer rebates for installation. Um, there are there will be uh, rebates. I don't know that Comet offers those yet. Uh, they may. I would have to check on that. But there are also going to be a lot of rebates. Um, there there are rebates in the Inflation Reduction Act too. So I just talked about the rebates on the car itself, but the Inflation Reduction Act will also have rebates on um, on those level two chargers. And there are a whole bunch of state and federal incentives for municipalities to also. Uh, so if, you know, the city of um, of Wilmette, say, wanted to build a bunch of uh, public chargers, there are incentives out there for the city to uh, help pay for all of that. The average life in a v of an EV compared to a, a gas-fueled car.
not know how to replay um, that, that sounds terrible um that is a good question i again the way that we dealt with that raymond in the cub uh, in the the guide was that um we figured that the average person kept a uh, a vehicle whether it's gas or we you know, we expect that people people tend to keep vehicles for i think it's roughly 12 years I don't know that we expect a person who gets an EV, like, you know, would you keep your car for that same amount of time It's an, if it's an EV? Um, so uh, the point is, I think that most people trade off or get new cars before they, before that car reaches the end of its life. And so um, I, I don't know that we have any numbers specific to to that in the guide. Do you still get a rebate when buying a used DV? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, you're the vehicle to grid and grid to load. So let me go back up and see what your question was. Uh, well, now I've missed the context of your question, if you wouldn't mind typing that in again. Um, Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Good to know, Michael. Michael's 2006 Prius battery had to be replaced at 150,000 miles and cost $2,000. Um, yeah, and I think Michael makes a really good point there. Consider that battery prices are getting cheaper all the time. In eight years, they could be half the price. And I think, you know, that was a kind of a driving force behind um, the Inflation Reduction Act was to drive down the cost. And I know that it's one of the governor's priorities here to figure out ways that we can drive down the cost of manufacturing, um, not just the batteries, but the vehicles also. Uh, and so, yeah, I do suspect, just like when we talk about batteries for solar storage, we expect a pretty, pretty big drop in price. Yeah, um, uh, Michael, I also your question about um, community solar with Clearway and then requiring you to use ComEd's fixed pricing, fixed rate pricing. Um, it is so that is the recommendation that community solar providers uh, make uh, because uh, we have seen instances where people don't like where they keep an alternative supplier. Uh, and pair that, you know, that with their community solar, and it has caused some issues um, because the law does not require alternative suppliers to offer you the same, offer you the same discount on their supply rate, if that makes any sense. And so if, um, so pairing community solar with ComEd's hourly pricing, yes, you can do that. And uh, Michael, if you want to reach out to me also, um, I can I can talk a little bit more about that with you through uh, email or over the phone as well. Are there any more questions? Uh, okay, I don't see any more. I did have one where somebody asked about the recording. I will send out the recording link with it, probably not tomorrow, but the day after, along with um, all the other links that um, Scott had, in, including these slides and to the guidebook and his, um, there were articles, links. To yeah, I, and I'll, I will I'll, link. Oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. I was going to say, I will link those now for okay. people. Um, if you want to uh, copy and paste them somewhere. So this is the link to the NPR article that does a good job explaining the federal uh, rebates and incentives. And here is a link to the NBC Chicago article that does a good job of explaining the Illinois or the lack of Illinois incentives. Although I think this article was written before the fund run, ran out of money. Um, and then here is a link to 
uh, ComEd's hourly pricing program, and they have a, a, a rate, they, they talk specifically on their webpage about electric vehicles. And this is a link to that webpage where they talk about pricing for electric vehicles. So yeah, I one, I, Jill, I really appreciate you setting this up. Um, I was telling Jill before we started, this was my first all EV presentation. So um, uh, you all suffered through my very clumsy first round of this. And um, please feel free to reach out to me, especially if I didn't adequately answer one of your questions. And I am more than happy to go back and correct myself um, or or find you more information. I really appreciate all of you showing up and listening in. Uh, uh, it's fun for me, so um, feel free to get in touch anytime. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Scott, and I want to thank everyone who uh, logged on tonight. And I'll get the the recording out to the to people who want it and the guidebook link as well. So thank you so much. And I'm going to stop everybody. recording and end this. Okay. Okay.